so Colton and I were just catching up because it's been since what, like since we recorded these songs since we've that's seen the last them. time we saw each other in person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've spoken maybe twice since then, but yeah, a handful of times. So Colton Foster is an amazing bassoon player. He's also one of my favorite humans on this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. And when I when I was writing these songs, I um when I was writing these songs and I knew that I was going to be putting them on an album, the first thing I thought was, oh, there's going to be bassoon. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> the first <laughs> instrument was, and there will be bassoon. And then, and then I was like, that's oh, what, great. That's what God said in the beginning. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's so funny. Bassoon is not usually the top of people's minds. Um, it's usually like an afterthought in any kind of album process, but I'm really glad to hear that it was like forefront in the, in the mix. You know? Well, so I wasn't, I wasn't, I knew that it wasn't going to be the forefront of the mix, but I knew it was the type of album that would have bassoon. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. Yeah. The bassoon is like a flavor that if added will really, you know, it's like, what's a strong flavor ingredient that would like really alter uh i don't know like like basil leaves you don't want to throw it or like those bay leaves you, yeah the bassoon is like the bay leaf of instruments it's gonna would, change yeah i was gonna say the fish sauce to your pad thai but <laughs> <laughs> no you're right because if you don't it, but if you don't put fish sauce on pad thai like it's That's just right like wheat noodles and then it's gross <laughs> The bassoon is more of the fish sauce than the bay leaf. You're right. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's so nice to hear. I'm glad you were uh, thinking that this is going to be a, a pad thai of an album. Um, yeah. Well, I've, no, yeah. I, I like, okay, so I, so I was thinking about instrumentation. I definitely wanted horns and bassoon and strings and... And when I knew I wanted bassoon, I was like, yes, I get to call Colton. <laughs> and, um, and so to catch you guys up, Colton and I haven't seen each other since we recorded it. We haven't seen each other in person since we recorded the tracks, what, like four and a half-ish years ago. And so since that time, I have, um, I have moved to an island and published a book i've moved off of an island i've moved around the country to tour and then i've lived with family members to care for them and then moved to nashville um and i think i was with i think i knew everything except i did not know that you landed in nashville mm. That's the thing. I think that's where we, I lost track a little um, of your adventures. Well, because that's when your life got exciting too, right? My life's been very exciting pretty much since, like, yeah, yeah. My life, the last, uh, like, four years have been very exciting. Um, but, yeah, things, things are just continuously getting more and more exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so Colton has studied bassoon at yeah. the collegiate level for yes. nine years i'm entering my ninth that's what's happening yeah i can describe i don't know i don't know whether to like gag or like hide yeah. and run for the covers or get really excited for you or like yeah what is what's happening it's it's definitely the laughing while crying emoji okay um yeah that's it's, I'm honestly baffled every day that the bassoon is a viable life choice. <laughs> For the last three years, I've made my living exclusively, no, actually, it's the last like five and a half, I've made my living exclusively playing the bassoon, teaching, and doing arts administration. It's so, like since I graduated, it's been 
freelance lifestyle since then. Um, and I'm doing it still. And the goal is to just keep doing it, but more so. And hopefully with less having $76 in my bank account, which is what's happening today. <laughs> yeah, it's been a rough and tumble, but I really like it. I like how much it makes me grow. I like how much it makes me like have to keep disciplined. And it's been an excellent uh, catalyst for me to go off into the world and see, see things and meet people and just improve. It's my medium for like self-improvement, I think. <laughs> okay, so here's, this is one of the things that I was so struck with when like the day we recorded the, the tracks um, was that fact that you were using your instrument as a tool of like personal development and personal growth. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't ever, well, I mean, I didn't, hadn't, I don't think I had ever really encountered another musician who had overtly announced that as like, hello, <laughs> this is my instrument. It is my tool of personal development. Like, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that's kind of my opening pitch. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. No, that's it. I, yeah. It's just like the classical music world is so weird. And like, if I was doing this just so I could go get a job, <laughs> bark it up the wrong tree there, you know? <laughs> like it's, that's, that's tough. Um, it's like if you were a basketball player and you only play basketball to get into the NBA. It's like, you have to also really love it. Mm -hmm. And like, it has to be doing more for you than just like financially, you know? Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I, when I started, this is something interesting to note, and maybe we've talked about this. When I started college at Western Washington University, I was going with the intention of being a photojournalist. That was my advising was all journalism. I was just like, I was going for it. I've got some journalists in my family. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'll do the thing. And I liked photography, but I played bassoon and a little bit of bass and I wanted to be a, a music minor. And by the end of my first year, I had just completely fallen in love with music. So I was like, uh, I was just, I just, everyone was like, you're a music major now, right? I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess so. Shows you, <laughs> I had no idea what was going on, but I had this incredible teacher, Francine Peterson, who is like a living legend, one of the great bassoon teachers in the country, and just like a hidden gem who has taught so many people in the Northwest. And she's had a lot of really successful students, um, in you know the traditional sense like they've got they're making a living playing bassoon um and i can i can count myself among those to some extent you know i'm not i i don't have like you know a full-time bassoon playing job but i'm making a living as a musician and that's a hundred percent like not a hundred you know what i mean like i would not have any any of this without having had that teacher in that environment where i was able to like just go like oh this is different i've never had a teacher like this and then you know bada bing Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the impact that she had on me was like what motivated me to try to be a teacher too, because mm -hmm. I recognized that if she had taught me more than just the bassoon, she taught me how to be a person. She like taught me about life and the things that she taught me out tied in with music. So that's where I learned that like the bassoon is a way, the bassoon, you know, a lot of her students, probably the vast majority of them are not bassoonists now. They are whatever, but all of them can thank Francine for like teaching them professionalism and you know etiquette and a love of music and I think more than anything the uh the learning mentality that like I can get better if I practice and if I'm disciplined I will grow like I, when, as a teacher now I have a lot of young students especially who just don't have that mindset I'm like do you know that if you practice you'll you'll get better and they're like no and then maybe just being in middle school, but still like <laughs> my goal is to try to continue to show that I'm growing and learning as a musician and as a person and then influence my students just through example, if nothing else. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of a long answer. I'm not even sure if you asked a question. 
<laughs> I didn't, but I'm glad you kept talking. I was, I was just fascinated. And I've met Francine and she is a firecracker. Oh yeah. She'll tell you what's on her mind. It's and fun. Yeah. For me, I, I just, she was the perfect teacher and you know, yeah, she, she's, she's a genius. I mean, she's, I'm, and she would hate me for saying that, but she is. I've seen probably the most impressive thing is that she's incredibly adaptable with her students. Um, I've had the privilege of getting to watch her teach a full day of, of, stu of private studio students, I think twice. And, you know, the first time when she started treating one of the students totally different than me, I was like, oh, like, I thought this is just how you taught. It's like, no, you know, she's, she's really empathetic. Um, like empath level empathetic and she can tell what's what a student needs in a way that is it's an x factor that can't really be taught you know and actually that's one of the reasons i decided to go back to school for music is that i recognized that besides having some ability of musically i was also i had that inclination that she has teaching wise where I'm, i can tell I can read, you know, I'm empathetic. Like I can tell what a student is going through that day or like what they need, if I need to be tough or supportive. And all of this is tied together with, her, for her as somebody who continues to learn every day. She's never just like, oh, I'm a great bassoon teacher. Let me just coast now. Like she's always going to master classes and taking notes, talking to other teachers, trying different things out. And I'm, that's kind of where I'm at too. It's just like, I want to continue to learn throughout my life, you know? Um, and all the best teachers that I've had and have now all have that mentality. Um, yeah. Do you, do you find that like, okay, so in the last four years. Yeah. Like think back fr from like the day that we recorded to today. Okay. Whoa. Um, there's a lot that went on. <laughs> I know there's a lot that went on. Okay. What would you, just because I'd be like really curious, like what would you have told like that version of like that Colton? Like, like today. <sighs> um, God. Well, if we're going to go back to the year after I graduated from college. Yep. This is like 2013 and to 2014. That year was kind of a wash. We're not going to count that year. Okay. The next year, <laughs> that's when I started really, like, that's when I first, because that, that year was weird. And I was like commuting between Bellingham and Seattle. Mm -hmm. I was working as the coordinator of Maristone. And I was like doing all this for the first time. I was fresh out of college. And I had like, all this stress and I was working two different jobs and I was in this relationship and it was like a year on the road basically. My heart was spread between two cities. I was a mess. So if I had talked to me then, I probably wouldn't have heard it because I was too wrapped up in myself. The following year, um, that's when I stopped going to Bellingham so much. I really like started setting down roots in Seattle and was like starting to investigate myself as a person. Um, I would probably have told me that it's okay to be gay. <laughs> I didn't know that at that time. <laughs> I probably would have had some more interesting experiences if I had been quicker on the, on the, on the uptake on that one. Um, it took me another two years in Seattle, two or three years in Seattle, two years in Seattle for me to like get there. And you know, that was, that was rough. And I've kind of just like, would have, I would have been like, hey, it's, so, it's cool to be, that's, that's probably what I, told, I would have told myself. Um, otherwise, I just need I to feel like that's a, that's a pretty big one. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, <laughs> I, I figured out by the time I was, when I was 26, I had been living in Seattle for like three years, two of which I was really present for. And I was really like leaning into this queer community out there. And I was like, uh, doing, I was doing some psychedelics and I was doing some some personal healing work, you know? And uh, yeah, long story short, I was <laughs> 26 and realized that it's okay to be attracted to more than one type of person, um, which was just something that had never occurred to me in my upbringing. Um, 
and then I moved to Akron, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> it's turned out to be fine. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting navigating this transition while also like tra traveling the country to be a student again. It's been very, it's been amazing. I, my life is so much better now. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, that would have been cool to know earlier. That would have been really cool to know earlier. When I was a kid, people always told me I was gay. And I was just like, come on, man. Like, you can't tell me that. <laughs> it's my life. Like, <laughs> and so but finally, in middle school, I sat myself down and I said, all right, man, everyone thinks you're gay. Are you gay? And I was like, well, that would mean that I, well, I, I like women. So no, like, I can't be gay. And it had never been, ex like, my, I remember, and my mom I, is, is great, but, there were some things that were built in to my mom and my dad that, like, I remember her saying once uh, that people that are bisexual just need to make up their mind. She does not think that now, but I know she said it. And even if it was something I imagined, that stuck with me. And yeah. so I, I was like, that was the end of it. In middle school, I was like, well, I like women, so I'm not gay. And it took me all, all what I just described I was like maybe I'm bi but I didn't really hate the word because I don't think that gender is binary so it's like that doesn't work for me and then my friend Rose that I was living with said you got to come to this cool like lesbian dance party that I'm going to and I was just like what? yeah okay <laughs> cool that sounds fun it was this it was a, it's a party for queer people in Seattle and when I got there I was like these are my people. Like I figured it out. I figured out who I recognized myself in them. And I decided to use the label queer. And when I did that, it opened up all these friendships and avenues and partnerships and things like that, that just, I had never had access to before because I didn't know what to call myself. I didn't know what I was. So in that sense, I found that label to be very useful. Um, okay. So yeah. this is actually really, appropriate because one of wait I have to like think back to like yes yes one of the songs you played on um it's, the track is sh called Shade of Silver yeah and the chorus is all about like in betweens holding everything that's right oh I remember that and and it was it was from like I wrote it because I had several different versions of this kind of story, either sexual orientation or like vocation or like, what do I do with my life or where do I live or yeah. those, all of those kinds of situations when they come up, there's a lot of power that comes from like not deciding. That's cool. Right? Yeah, right. And when, and when you choose not to decide, <laughs> you actually then get to like open all the doors. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's sort of what happened for me going back to school too, which was like, I had this mentality that like, you know, I wasn't good enough at being a bassoonist to make it as a bassoonist. But then when I recognized that I could follow my dream, you know, my, my, be an art, be an artist. And what I said, all my friends in Seattle were these amazing artists that were working full time at coffee shops and making art on the side. And I was like, that's my worst case scenario. If I try really hard to be a professional musician is that I have to work at a coffee shop and make my music on the side. That was so liberating to not have that all or nothing mentality. And now that I'm out here doing that, it's like, um, that's just, it's not all or nothing. Like nobody has just one job in music. It's like three or four or five different jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm excited. I'm not even gonna limit myself to that. Maybe I'll have one job later. I don't know. Things change. Uh, I think, yeah, along with the other things that I've talked about, like adaptability is probably my other like crucial element of like, like growth and adaptability 
and like kindness top three <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um that's so sweet i really i'm glad i just, that find, I just find that so <clears throat> i just find that so magical that like yeah. you know whether you realized it or not you know you were i don't know you maybe that I'm, was a really that was Maybe that I'm taking really too much. Experience. Maybe yeah. I'm taking too much meaning into it. No, I don't but think like, so. Okay. I remember that feeling really special, like when we were there. Um, like the energy that you brought into that space, or it was like, I had never done that before. You know, I'd never played in a recording session that wasn't like, here's your notes. <laughs> you know, um, and you really made me feel comfortable trying that. Cool. So there's a there's another shade of silver. Like I'm not just a bassoon player that plays off of notes. I can also, you know, you trusted me to like make some music that was cool, and yeah. that helped me get out of that box too. Um, yeah, you aren't reading too much into that. I remember okay. thinking that's pretty cool when I was re when I was playing it too. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. excited. I'm excited. I'm really I'm really really glad. I'm like one of the reasons why. I did this podcast was because um I like I love you guys so much like all of the musicians who played on the album like it just seems like like it's I'm really super honored that you guys played on the songs but I also wanted to give you guys even more of a spotlight because one nine nine years at the collegiate level like come on <laughs> i mean <laughs> let's let's like let's like at least let's let's at least give you a podcast episode <laughs> if that's all you know i'll take it uh, it but truly like the bassoon has taken me so many places it like we wouldn't have met if i wasn't a bassoonist Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, no. I wouldn't have played on your album. I wouldn't be on your podcast. I wouldn't be in Cincinnati. Like, what? <laughs> How was I supposed to get up? I moved to Akron, Ohio, and then to Cincinnati. There's, I had to have a reason for doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even know, I didn't even know Akron existed before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the bassoon has, it's, it's been my, uh, like, broomstick for, to fly around the world. It's like I have a visual eye <laughs> in my mind sometimes. It's taken me a lot of interesting places. Um, That's... Yeah, I'm so I'll never forget this album. I'm so glad to be on it. And like, oh, uh, man. like it's like the first experience that I had doing that. And it's funny that right when you scheduled this, I was doing it again. Uh, I replayed on. I just played like, you know, like eight bars on somebody's album. They just need, they had bassoon in their mind for those like eight bars, and I was like, put me in, coach. Like I'm ready. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, like, if there are other musician songwriters, or producers listening to this, Bassoon is hella cool. And, re to this and really versatile, and, yes. it's, like, if you, um, so Mackenzie Spear is the mixing um, engineer for the album, and she put some, like, when we were mixing the album we were really me we were really messing around with your tracks cool and they're really there are some really cool things like some really cool effects that you can put on like the tone of the bassoon is like no it's like alien there's yeah. nothing else you can you can't get any other sound like that no and i really yeah you can use it and like nobody will know what it is Just yeah be like this sounds familiar somehow. It can it can make alien noises. It can make like cool, funny bass lines. It can like, yeah, it's a it's a crazy instrument. Um, and if you if you it, get a if you get a good bassoonist too, you're gonna want a good one. You're gonna want a good one first of all, <laughs> um, <laughs> for sure. But <laughs> you um, like you can do like pitch warping and yeah. like oh man there's so there's so many cool things you can do with the instrument itself it just doesn't it doesn't have to just be like the villain in a cartoon which is what we usually are right 
bah, 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 bah. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> but if you need that, we can do that too. Yeah. Right? Like we, <laughs> I'll be your cartoon villain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so if, um, Okay, so we, we talked about the bassoon for musicians, songwriters, producers, but if you have no idea what a bassoon is. Mm. What would I tell someone who has no idea what a bassoon is? Go listen to the Mickey Mouse Sorcerer's Apprentice thing, you know, Fantasia, check that out. You'll hear mm -hmm. the bassoon featured prominently in its uh, bumbling villain uh, role. Um, bum. It's us. That's that's what I do <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> uh, and otherwise, I don't know. If people are interested, they should just go search bassoon on YouTube and click on the first couple of YouTube videos. They're all pretty good, mm -hmm. um, and you'll see that it can play some pretty wicked stuff. Um, and if you want to get nerdy about it, you know, find your local bassoonist and dig in. Cause it's, it's a dork town, man. We're, <laughs> we'll talk all day. Um, I will say, I will say that every bassoonist I've met is, is a certain personality type and, and very fun to be around. You gotta be weird to be a bassoonist. There's just no way around it. Like you're going to have to be, even the coolest, like cool dude bassoonists are like, you're still weird. We're like viola players, you know, I love viola players, but they're type two, you know, they're fun type, you know. <laughs> Great. It's so fantastic. Yeah. It's so fantastic. Yeah. yeah. The bassoonists are always like, you know, what's really fun working with kids is that I can tell like a kid, like what instrument they should play. It's like a personality type. It's like, a, not everyone's like that, but there are some people where you're like, you're going to play the bassoon. Like I can tell. <laughs> and I think that's how I ended up doing it. The high school and middle school band directors, I think, just handed me a bassoon because they could tell I fit the bassoon type. Really? Somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't remember ever saying, I never asked to do it. I think I must have said yes. And they handed so, me a bassoon. I know that I picked the cello because I came home from choir one day, like elementary school choir. For some reason, the choir director rubbed me the wrong way that day. And I said, Mom, I'm going to be in orchestra. I don't care what, what's going to happen. I'm going to be in orchestra. And she was like, I don't know. Well, what are, what instrument are you going to play? Like, pfft. and, um, and I was like, I don't, I don't care. And so she was like, well, I, <laughs> she goes, she goes, well, I don't want to hear you learn how to play the violin. So, Fair enough. <laughs> and, and the bass is too big to carry around also fair and the viola never gets the good parts so this is what your mom said <laughs> yeah she's a piano teacher so oh she, she, she gets it yes yeah, so she was like so okay well, well you'll play the cello that's and, dope and there it was yeah that's the way you do it my yeah. parents i wanted to be a percussionist and my parents just said no and i was like oh <laughs> man <laughs> i would have been a cool percussionist that would be fun but no, I played clarinet and then I volunteered to switch to bass clarinet because I was tired of like competing for the principal chair in my like sixth grade class or whatever it was. You know, we were, I was pretty good. No, I like, that was the only thing I had over anyone else is that I have that, you know, that musical ear, mm -hmm. which means I could play the right notes without practicing. Um, which, oh my gosh. So I, I picked up, they, they just gave me the bassoon and they said, go to town, kid. And I took no lessons. I didn't know anything. I couldn't even put it away again into the case the first time I played it. I put it together and made some sounds based on this like book that I had. And then I couldn't put it away because I didn't know <laughs> where the pieces fit in the case. <laughs> and that was my... Uh, not an encouraging start, but I stuck with it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I taught myself the bassoon for high school. And then I had a teacher for like six months before I went to college. And yeah, I mean, I was a mess. You can't teach yourself the bassoon. It's not. <laughs> when I got to college, yeah, I met, you know, Francine was just like, you know, she, she just knew what to do with me because she's such an expert at teaching beginning students. And 
she had a similar issue, which was when she started, she had had a bad teacher for her first year. Um, and I had had a worse teacher my first four years because it was me and I didn't know anything at all. Uh, also, in high school, I did not know that, you that if you practiced things, you got better. I was unaware of that. Um, so uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just like, I, I kind of, we started over from scratch, basically. I had to break all of my bad habits. And this is what made, part, partly what made her such a great teacher was that she had to break all of her bad habits and start over. And so she was aware of them. She was a college student when she was doing that. Mm -hmm. And so having seen her go, go from doing that to being this, you know, legend in the bassoon world, I was like, well, I should give it a shot, you know, like, I have that too. I've, I've broken these bad habits. I'm continuing to break them. And sometimes the great teachers, sometimes the great bassoonists, you know, they learned from when they were like in sixth grade and they just were prodigies from the beginning and they don't know how to teach. Like they can't get, they can't empathize with somebody who's like struggling right. because it just came naturally to them to some extent. Um, I haven't had that problem. <laughs> it's, been very difficult <laughs> uh, anyway yeah that's well that's I think I I'm, I'm again like so honored to have you on this album I'm so proud of you I'm Aww. so like in all the ways <laughs> you too every You're time I see your me. every time I see your little face scroll by on Instagram I'm, I like like it and then <laughs> want to like it again but I can't <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just so great to have you on the album and, um, cold yeah. and amazing. go take bassoon lessons from him. Well, if, if anybody is in the Cincinnati area, um, I work for this really amazing youth orchestra. We haven't talked about this. Yeah. I have the best job. Um, uh, I work for this really incredible youth orchestra in my, called My Cincinnati. That's, uh, in Price Hill, uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, just one of the neighborhoods in Cincinnati. So we specifically work with this group, uh, like this neighborhood. Um, it's a F El Sistema style program. So it's a free after school, everyday program. Uh, the instruments are all provided. Everything's, everything's totally free. And uh, it's kind of like a community development um, corporation that, that, runs, that runs our organization. So we're kind of like the arts and community development branch of it. And they're also, they're doing a lot of other work in the community to awesome. help mitigate the foreclosure crisis there and stuff like that. Super dope. Uh, I love this job. Everyone is amazing. The students, I like miss them all the time. I just want to hang out with them all the time. And we are putting on a, what we call the Price Hill Creative Community Festival. It's happening on the 19th and 20th. Um, and it's an annual event of July. It's an annual event and it's incredible. I hope you can come see awesome. it sometime. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'll make sure to put links to yeah. the organization and to anything else that you want to share. Um, yeah. In this episode. I found out about this job through Tinder. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I ran, tell. Talk last to me. Su last summer, um, I, I ran this, or Emily and I actually know each other because, well, I'm not sure how we met but we worked Maristone. together at Maristone. it was that, that was how that was how we met so Maristone summer music festival is this like music camp for um, high like, school like high school and college high school and college kids yeah. in orchestra symphony yeah. instrument kids yeah and I was the like student liaison student but you were actually my emotional was, support <laughs> yeah I ended up being kind of like like camp count like camp head counselor basically for this yeah thing. that's what it is yeah <laughs> you were incredible i don't know how i would have done that without you so um, much fun yeah so that's for a different another conversation but because uh, there's a lot we can talk about with that <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yes a lot. um oh goodness but getting where was i we were oh last summer i went and ran that festival again I did, yeah. did you know that? Yeah. Between my master's degree and this artist diploma that I'm getting at CCM, the, uh, they got the person that had taken my job got a different job, so they needed somebody to do it. So I went back and ran the festival again for three months. No big it deal. It went well. 
yeah, it was fine. No, it was actually my best year uh, of the four that I ran it because I was like so much less worried about everything. You know, Great. I was like, I'm just going to do the best I can. And so it went well. While I was there, I went on a Tinder date uh, and we just became friends and hung out a couple of times. And she was like, oh, you're in Cincinnati. You're a musician. Cool. I've got a friend that plays violin in Cincinnati. Um, he actually runs this youth orchestra. Oh, actually, they're looking to hire a double lead player for their wind <laughs> program. And I was Get just like, down. what? <laughs> She's like, are you interested? And I was like, yeah, I'm interested. Like, send me the details. Let's do this. And it was perfect. I mean, when I saw it, I was like, this is, I have to get this job. <laughs> like, it's incredible. And That's I, amazing. Yeah, and I was the right fit for them. And I had the right attitude towards it. And let the I record, still can't believe it. I let the record it. state that yeah. nothing good hasn't come from Tinder. I love Tinder. I stand for Tinder. Yeah. I meet, I meet somebody amazing on Tinder at least once a year. Great. <laughs> Some of my dearest friends. Great. And my job. Yeah. Tinder's sponsoring. Is Tinder sponsoring this podcast? Um, sure. <laughs> sure. All right. Use promo sure. code yeah. Emily and Pete at <laughs> checkout. Exactly. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not real. <laughs> it's not it's not real, you guys. Um it's just, cool. just we're just we're just hanging. Um this is just so fun <laughs> to hang out with you. I just love hanging with you. And um you guys, Colton's amazing. Go listen to the bassoon. Go listen to the album. Um yeah, I can't wait to hear this album again. It's been so long. And I'm excited to listen to myself without judgment, because I know part of me is going to be like, oh, your pitch was weird or your tone wasn't as good as it should be. And that's okay. That's okay. You helped me get out of my head about a lot of stuff to play that. Anyway, we should good. talk again. Let's do this it again. It sounds sometimes. good. It sounds good. Um, it sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, 